Hello everyone and welcome back to the Insomnia True Silver Championship 3. I'm Raven and we've got a treat for you this time for the final match of the day. We're joined on the couch by Sotl, of course, and Firebat decided to join us for the last game of the day. Just, just to be clear, we know which part of that is the treat, right? You, in, you introduced that. Definitely Firebat. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's not even a question. We have a treat of these two casters, one that you don't give a crap about, and Firebat. Yeah, it's right. like one guy you see all the time, right. and then Firebat, yeah. who we're all really here to see. Yeah. I feel pretty loved. This is good. I like this. <laughs> I wish every cast started like this. <laughs> I'm digging it. And what's also great is if you buy your Insomnia tickets for Insomnia 59, you get 25% off. If you buy them this weekend, either online, or if you're actually here at the event, you can get it off as well. So that's a pretty good discount just for just for buying them today instead of on Monday, for example. Yeah, I mean, what's free money, right? Like, if you're yeah. going to come anyway, get the job done today, save yourself 25%. Seems good. Yeah, definitely. And uh, this is going to be the last game we're going to show today. This is going to decide the final spot in the top eight that will be concluded tomorrow with crowning another true silver champion. So, you know, how have you guys enjoyed the day so far? Obviously, uh, maybe a slightly different answer from you, Firebat, but... <laughs> but <laughs> Sam, it started so well, and now, <laughs> no, now yeah. savage. No, this is still out. me being pleasant. Come okay, on, but, okay. Sol, how have you enjoyed the day so far? It's been, it's been a roller coaster. It there has. has been highs and lows. There's been Oskaka forgetting how to swing a war axe. There's been leaving Aviana up. There's been Yog insanity, fatigue games, like upsets, expected players going through. It's been nuts and I've just enjoyed being here to, to call all of it I guess so I've had a great time so far. And Firebat you've been to Insomnia a few times now how yeah. do you enjoy the event like do you like it or? Yeah Insomnia is one of my favorite events simply because when you fly in you get you land at the airport you know like normally when you fly yeah typical <laughs> that's, that's normally a good plan. But you usually the most tournaments you gotta like drive somewhere to go to your hotel and then drive somewhere to go to the venue and it's a lot of traveling and Insomnia is great. You just land and then you walk like a very short way and you're just at the hotel. And then from the hotel, you just wake up and you walk a little bit and you're at the venue, which is just the nuts. It is, <laughs> it is the superior play. So I, I really like Insomnia mainly just for that. I mean, it, of course, it's I was going to say, it's also a pretty it's, good it's event a pretty good and event. tournament as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. But I, the convenience is also just A+. Plus. You got to <laughs> give a shout out to the people that organize where the hotel and stuff is. They're, they're killing it. So. I can't get much higher praise than that from Firebat himself. <laughs> Somewhere there's there's a multiplayer employee like, yes, Firebat, <laughs> we Firebat did it. noticed me, yes. <laughs> yeah, so can't really argue with that. So I'm glad you're all having a good time. But we do have the final match of the day, which is going to be yet another good one. No doubt a bit of a roller coaster. It's going to be Ecop versus Neyman. So, you know, what do you guys think about these two players? Ecop making a, making a bit of a splash in this tournament and uh, Neyman just continuing his run of just awesome results. Yeah, I mean, Ecop really interests me. I made this this point the last game that he was on he was on stream for, where he got a reputation which I think was generated primarily from Raynad early on of like you know being this guy that was benefiting from nepotism in the early days of Hearthstone. But I think since then he hasn't really had much handed to him at all. He's had to grind as much as anyone else, um, and he's still been putting in successful results. And of course, Neyman has had his his share of adversity as well, but came back this year to be European champion, which you know speaks for itself, <laughs> right? You don't need to sell that. Yeah, and even results from then onwards, you know, even after yeah. he won the championship, he's been continuing to perform. Obviously, joined Virtus Pro with uh, you know players like Dot Tippy as well and Bunny Hopper. So that's been a, becoming very quickly a powerhouse team as oh. well. They're performing extremely well. We've seen Dot Tippy is requalified for championships <laughs> again, which is kind of ridiculous, right? Yeah, Dr. Ibi has one of the highest like win rates in Hearthstone right now over a like decent series of games. So, you know, him being a teammate of Nyman, probably helping him out and stuff like that. And also Nyman's just had continual success. We can look at Star Ladder as well as an example. He was able to qualify for the land finals in China for that. So definitely I would say he's the favorite in the series, but it could still go anyone's game, right? Like it's Hearthstone, Ecop's a good player. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see him like take yeah. it either he's trying to like step up his game obviously he just recently uh left cloud nine so he's out on his own trying to make a name for himself again and uh, get onto a new organization most likely yeah and he's off to a good start so far but uh we can actually just check out the group now just to see sort of the journey these two players have had so far they uh ecop came through the swiss and Neyman actually qualified through the pro qualifier as well, so two slightly different journeys, but within the group stage themselves, we see it is six O ball control Neyman and Ecop in a group. Yeah, and they actually clashed in the first round okay. with, with Ecop coming out victorious. So this is a revenge match. A lot of these lower bracket decider matches have been. You know, it's kind of a 50-50 shot. That's what you're going to end up with a lot of the time. So oh. um, yeah, Ecop is uh, is holding the one-zero advantage. Neyman looking for for the revenge. 
Yeah, I was saying, and I just said that Naaman was looking like the favorite based on like <laughs> track history and other tournament performance, but I think we really should just consult this tournament's performance. <laughs> I mean, if you already beat the guy once, you can probably beat him again, so I want to switch my vote and say <laughs> no, the No, you cannot do this. <laughs> oh, committed. Uh, one vote per cast. Well, I didn't have all the information. I don't, that's, it doesn't matter. That can only if be your I vote. voted prematurely. If I you, rung the buzzer too soon. If you go to the ballot station on poll day and you, you cast your ballot and then you walk out afterwards and say, I didn't have all the information, you don't get to cast another vote. And we know that because that's how Brexit happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. Not going to carry that Maybe one on, Maybe we should on, change guys. the system. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> it might be beneficial. <laughs> So, the players are look like they get, they're looking like they're going to be getting ready, and it looks like their actual classes are all mirrored, so maybe not actually mirrored decks, mm -hmm. but this is going to be... I always feel like this is kind of awkward in Last Hero Standing, because it feels like all the counter picks are going to feel really strange. It's more than likely going to come down to either like the first pick, see if it's a mirror match or not, or you know maybe mirror matches later on, because most players just don't really like playing the mirror matches at all. True. I, th I think one of the most crucial things in this matchup is going to be is uh, how well the Druid performs, right? Like, Druid's a deck that doesn't have any good matchups, doesn't have any bad matchups on the table. So if your Druid's able to, you know, spike a few matchups out of nowhere, suddenly you're in a huge favorited position because the Shaman and the Zoo Warlock both kind of counter each other in, mm -hmm. in sort of ways. So, like, each player has the counter to... Uh, the Shaman, but no player really has a counter to Zoo. So if the Zoo gets shut down by the Druid out of nowhere from one player, and the other player isn't able to do that because of uh, their Druid isn't able to get the you know the Innervate start or what have you, then they're probably going to get swept out by that uh, by that Zoo that just goes unanswered. I feel like we've been saying that about Druid for like the past two years, right? Oh so yeah, it's, like, it's forty-five to fifty-five against everything. That's but that sometimes Innervate you card. Just draw Innervate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, Fibat just said it'll be an important one if a druid can beat one of the zoo lists, and, and this is going to be the first game, so wow. enjoy, guys. Take it away. Thank you so much, Raven. It is going to be, yeah, zoo up against the, the Yog Druid, or at least Token Druid of some variety, and you said Innovate can be a game changer. There's two of them, oh, and a yeah. Nourish. Oh, you get rid of the Nourish, though. You, you, you definitely, at this point, should know that it's zoo. should have been scouting. You know, you ask your friends or whatnot, and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, Ecop was playing zoo. You also assume Ecop's probably playing zoo. I've never seen Ecop play Reno Lock in a major tournament before, so I'd have to expect that it's most likely going to be zoo. So I think you would pitch the Nourish, pitch the Savage Roar. They're both a little bit too slow, not really what you want to be doing. You want to innervate minion A and then innervate minion B. <laughs> Sounds like a <laughs> solid game plan. <laughs> Let's do that. If Minion A is Violet Teacher, then all the better, because that oh, just yeah. works wonderfully when Minion B comes out with the second innovate. You know, if Minion A is Violet Teacher, Minion B is Violet Teacher, <laughs> and then you just do anything else after that, it's absolutely insane. He does opt to keep the Nourish. I'm a little bit interested by that. Oftentimes, you know, spending all of your cards to invest in one minion, which yeah. is basically what this does, it gets blown out of the way by things like Abusive Sergeant, Power Overwhelming, right. any of Zoo's sort of buff cards. So it's a, definitely a risky approach. Yeah, it's why Violet Teacher is such a huge deal, right? Because primarily when you're, you're trying to navigate a game against Zoo, it's not how many stats do I have in play compared to them? It's, how many you know, bodies? Yeah, how many yeah. individual attacks do I have to make them make to interact with my board? So, yeah, Violet Definitely. Teacher is a really big deal. Yeah, and Naiman's in a little bit of an awkward spot. He could go for you know, the turn one Nourish if he chooses to, or he also has the Raven Idol, but, you know, he keeps double Innervate Nourish. I think the, the idea behind that is going for the turn one Nourish, so yeah. I, I, I like sticking to your game plan when you make a game plan. I mean, this is a man that I witnessed take an Astral Communion off Raven Idol with this deck and then just jam it. And he he's a believer. Yeah. He's going to go ahead and trust his deck. Well, currently, his deck is not doing too great for him. <laughs> but he's got more tries at it, right? He can top deck in the future. It's... So the decision as to what to do with the, the leftover mana, which in the end it looks like he's going to Hero Power down the 3-2, yeah. I don't, there didn't seem yeah. to be any way that Hero Power would go face. The decision is like, do I try and set up this swipe? Do I set up a world where I can potentially Hero Power this down the next turn and do something with the with the, the card that I draw or the Raven Idol? Yeah. Um, but like, there's also a consideration of just getting the Raven Idol done that turn and just having more flexibility with uh, with what you draw and what you pick up. Oh, there that we go. will do nicely, though, will it? Because you're still leaving a 3-1 hanging around with this play. Yeah, and Ecop's play, he was about to play Dark Peddler, but he top decked the Power Overwhelming, so that made him think twice about it, and it made him want to invest, you know, the 1-1 one, one Death Rattle so that he would have targets for that Power Overwhelming the following turn. And you can see it's already paying dividends. He's going to be able to, you know, kill off this Violet Teacher very easily using that Power Overwhelming. 
I mean, naturalize seems unlikely. Force of Nature, Wisp, similar effects, but Force of Nature is a card you can actually play next turn, which seems important since he's given himself all this mana, but yeah. with no Ooh. card draw, he needs to draw something big on each turn, and that is a huge knife juggler. Yeah, that's that's pretty nasty. The power of overwhelming going down on the possessed villager, and th this flip's going to be really important because it, it allows him to preserve a flame imp, basically. Yeah. And this, yeah, yeah I mean... That, again, you can test your bravery on that play, right? Sure. If you'd have missed the first knife, then suddenly you have this thing where, like, ah, I'm just going to go face, and then the, the death rattle's going to kill it anyway when it goes off from the power overwhelming. Uh, I mean, if you're that ballsy, I don't know. It's usually, like, a really good idea to try and protect the knife juggler, so he's definitely happy that he's, he doesn't even have to think about that situation, sure. the mental strain of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, double Dark Peddler. Dark Peddler is so good when you're in these sort of top decking positions at Zoo because it just gives you so many bodies on the board, right? Like each minion is two bodies and having more bodies on the board allows more buff effects to be useful. And also sometimes you can just get more buff effects from it. So it's really just one of the best cards when you start running out of resources at Zoo. Similar to like Forbidden Ritual in the sense that you just get so much wider on the board so instantly. So with that in mind, he's going to go with the Soul Fire here because he trusts his ability to keep himself relatively open and uh, empty-handed here. So next turn, he'll have a one-mana card in his hand plus what he draws plus a Soul Fire, which is a pretty high percentage to be able to play all of that out with five mana on the next turn. As long as he doesn't top deck Doomguard. Right. So it's the nightmare, of course. Yeah. But, you know, anything up to Imp Gang Boss Darkshire Councilman level, then this curve works out perfectly. Yeah, so he's like at 20 out of 22 to be able to, you know, right. play his hand out. And it's just going to be the force of nature here. 3 2 2 seems to contest this board pretty nicely, but this is going to be an important draw, like we said. Well, I mean, that works too, right? Play yeah. two, one drop, soul fire something, life tap, everything seems fine. Yeah, the, the only question is, is he wants to tap instead of soul firing. Like, the soul fire is pretty low value here, but I think it's too risky to just like hold on to it and wait. Your opponent's top decking as well, so I think taking every little advantage where you can and right. is the best way to do it. Yeah, I agree. And you, th there was one turn where your deck was kind to you there. The the longer you wait, like not only Doomguard, you can draw like Sea Giant as well, which yeah. can end up being okay. awkward. So I think just dumping the Soul Fire there, just getting the value that you can from it, which, you know, in the end, it was a free peddler card. So any value is value to an sure. extent. Um, just generating through, picks up the Imgang boss for next turn anyway. Yeah. And Yikab was off to a good start, but he's not really getting any of those finisher cards. We don't see any, like, Dark Iron Dwarf hitting the table or Argus or any of the three drops until now, turn six. He's just had so many, you know, low-curve minions and no, no like, Councilmans or Doom Guards yet to really get in there and start trying to finish this game out. Might actually give Naiman a window here that he needs to start trying to stabilize. Yeah, he's, he's kind of whiffed on the mana usage so far. He hasn't really had huge power plays. He did spend five mana, of course, on the, on the Force of Nature, which picked up from Raven Idol, but... Hasn't really hit those those big spikes. You know, he'd love to have an Ancient of War in his hand by now, for example, and has whiffed on it so far. Ooh, he's going to hold on to the Wrath. That uh, is he's a... He's very confident the Fandral's going to stick. We're looking at double abusive Dark Iron Dwarf. Defender kind of does it. It mm. feels a little bit clunky. <laughs> so you can tap first before committing the Defender, maybe hit Power Overwhelming, and then be able to develop the Imp Gang boss. Sure. Yeah, uh, seems oh. reasonable. Knife Juggler not going to do the job. And, you yeah. kill that Fandral, though. You have to do yeah, it. Yeah, right? I, I think it, it, it feels so bad, but oh. Oh, he's the, oh. it, it's so close because you get to push in so much chip damage if you ignore it, but there's so many cards that punish you. Yeah, he's just going to suck it up and kill the Fandral here, which I think Druid's so low on resources and they've kind of shown you that they don't have big power plays in hand, so you can even, like, ba based on the way the game's developed so far, you can possibly earmark that left-hand yeah. card as perhaps, like, something like Wild Growth, like a dead card that's waiting to get usage. Yeah, especially since in the previous turn, Nyman actually picked up the Wrath for a second and then put it back down sure. when he was thinking about if, whether he wanted a Hero Power or Wrath, which, if Ecop was paying attention, could have gotten a read off of that of what the card was. Yeah, so I think like like long term, if those are the kind of cards you're putting your opponent on, you feel decently positioned to grind your opponent out as the zoo here, just by you know drawing decent sized threats every turn and, and flooding the board. Yeah, and more uh, that emperor might stick, but you might not be actually too upset about the emperor sticking. Yeah, I think this is significantly less impactful than the, the potential of the Fandral sticking. Yeah. Uh, basically, yeah, there's, there's only a, a certain level that the Druid can cycle to here. Like, the worst case scenario in terms of the Emperor actually getting value is Nourish, but then 
If there's a, a, a turn with like five mana spent on Nourish here, is that the end of the world for you as the Zoo player if there's not that big a reaction to your board? So that's probably never going to end too badly for you here. But yeah, most importantly, there's just a 5-4 on the board getting value every turn now and picking apart these, these minions. Sure, yeah. Uh, Nyman's getting very, very close to being able to you know, seal out this game. Yep. He's, he's definitely caught up by now. He has more minions on the field than the Zoo player does at this point. So that's absolutely crazy. And with this pickup right on curve, he's going to be able to develop two more minions, take the value trade on the knife juggler. And these are the situations where Zoo's like completely shut out. And yeah, I mean, it, it worked off for Nyman. He was able to, you know, take the risk early on of developing you know, getting the mana and then being able to catch up with hoping that he finds minions off the top and yep. things like that. And hoping that the, the Zoo player during that, you know, time didn't do anything super crazy. We saw Ecop missed his three drop, which is the most important thing against Druid. You know, you want to be hitting your Councilman or your Imp Gang boss on three. Druid just has a really hard time dealing with those minions. And Ecop didn't hit anything on four on curve and, you know, nothing on five on curve. And Zoo is a really curve-oriented deck. When you're yes. missing all those drops, you're not going to get much done. All right, and it's tempting for some people to like look at this situation as like, you know, why doesn't Zoo play some sort of comeback mechanism? Why isn't there a Hellfire in this deck? Why don't they play Shadow Flame? It's like, well, if they do, then the curve can't exactly. Is like the reason this doesn't happen that often is because they just have the best consistent curve in the game, so they get ahead of their opponent way more often. Like, sure, occasionally this game is going to happen, but your consistency is going to suffer so much by putting AOE cards in your deck that it's just this will end up happening more often just by you having a bad curve. Yeah, I mean, Ecop's still not even out of it. Doomguard's kind of like a comeback mechanism here, and he's able to catch up a little bit here. We can see the Soul of the Forest plus the Power of the Wild can come down to, you know, remove all of Ecop's threats besides a 1-1 one -one and leave Nyman with three 2-2s. Two mm. And then he can hero power the 1-1. One -one. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Nyman's going to have 6-6 six -six worth of stats. Ecop's going to have none. So his catch-up was, like, almost okay, but he's still behind, you know, five mana worth of minions. Wait, can he? Can he? Doesn't he have to hero power either the Councilman or the Doomguard here? How is he breaking this up? Oh, no, no, five and four. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're totally right. Yes, yeah, so he does get to hero power down the 1-1 one, one as well, so he's just going to retain a bunch of 2-2s two on the board, and yeah, this is this is the situation that you look at as a zoo player, and it's like, okay, three minions versus zero. This one's going to be tough. This is where you get, like, Forbidden Ritual mm -hmm. into Sea Giant. <laughs> Yeah, flame. You could play Forbidden far, Ritual though. into Sea Giant here, right? No, it fills the board too much. Uh, yeah, you, yeah. You, need, like, you need the board space. You need at least one like live minion on the board that you can then like attack off to make yeah. room for a zero mana Sea Giant. Oh, that's an Anixia. Well, Egob was really hoping that Nyman would top deck something small. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this one, of, like, one of many oh. cards that were not Anixia in his deck that turn would have been ideal for. Yeah. For it's, that it's is, rough. And that is just a turn too late. Like, Doomguard on the last turn, maybe that was enough to keep him in with a chance. It sure. still would have ended up losing out to the Anixia Sea Giant, similar kind of thing, honestly. But yeah, this yeah. has all just come one turn too late. Yeah, his threats this game were just a little bit too late. And, yeah. you know, that's what can happen when Druid double innervates into Nourish. It makes you kind of need to be on point with your Zoo draws to keep up with that. So. Uh, typically speaking, Zoo's slightly favored in the matchup. You know, some people will argue that, you know, it's closer to 50-50, but sure. pretty much everybody's in the range where it's like, you know, it's a really close matchup. Maybe 55 for the Zoo, right. you know, or some, somewhere in that range, depending on how your decks are teched and what have you. But uh, that's a really solid pickup for Nyman because Zoo is a powerhouse threat in this lineup for both players. How do you feel about generally like Zoo's position in the tournament meta right now? Because I've heard you know some people, you know, Chucky specifically, I remember bringing the point up at uh, North American Prelim, saying that Zoo is probably the, one of the most overrated decks in the tournament lineup at the moment, and it's like easily exposable. Like, did did you I bring definitely it as part think of your it lineup? is easily exposable? I did not bring it as part okay. of my tournament here, tournament lineup here, but I think Zoo's a pretty solid deck for uh, last year's standing mm -hmm. because you are able to set up these situations where it can sweep against a lot of the popular decks, sure. and uh, in Conquest, Quest, it runs the risk of just being easily targetable, right. but in last, in last year's standing, you can't target something out. You, you, only, you only need to beat it once, so there's no reason to like beat it three times like in Conquest. Right. You know? So it, it kind of flew under the radar, too, because all the talk about Zoo has been, Zoo sucks, Zoo's not very good, oh. and then people are like, well, I guess I don't need to prepare for Zoo, <laughs> and now you see players like Ecob and Nyman both having Zoo in their lineup, both making it this far, you know, putting it right back on the map. 
Yeah, Nyman's sticking with the really token-based list of this deck by the looks of things. A natural whisper of the old gods appearing out of his deck. We saw one being offered off uh, Raven Idol in the previous game, but I don't think we saw him draw one. But uh, that's interesting because I haven't really seen the combination of Arcane Giants and Wisps in the same decks. And, okay. And like, you know, Have we seen Arcane Giant from his deck yet? Uh, we haven't, yeah, but okay. like every every list that we've seen on stream so far has is been it? playing Arcane sure, Giants. Yeah. That seems to be like the trend in this tournament, but yep. interested is like whether you compare those two cards together, because generally you have to cut a little bit of the top end out of your deck to make room for the Arcane Giants. Sure. Um, primarily, so Wisps is one of those cards that's you know considered one of the greedy options that's like competing with your Ancient of Wars and Scenarius's yeah. and Anixias, etc. Yeah, there's there's a lot of players that really prefer the Ancient of Wars, and then there's a few players that really prefer the Wisps. Like, Jackie Chan comes to mind, namely, as a player that just always plays double Wisps. Yeah. And he has had so much success with the deck, so you can't really argue that, you know, the, the Wisps are not bad. Right. Like, they're, they're definitely a solid choice, and certain players that prefer them have been able to take them to great success. Yeah, and it's like, it's like a long-term lesson for Hearthstone is to never, like, completely mentally trash pile a card, right? Because when this card was announced, everyone looked at it and went, all right, like, meme card, never going to yeah. get played ever. Uh, and then suddenly, like, it just takes the, like, appearance of a new deck strategy, and suddenly you're like, hang on, 7 one ones or a buff that's basically Savage Raw. I kind of want that in my deck. Like, that yeah. sounds good. Yeah, yeah. I never thought that the card would see play when it first was printed, and now... You know, it's it's definitely a really solid card. It's it's interesting to see things develop like that. And wow, Nyman going with a very defensive play here, taking out the totem golem. Yeah, I think this is just about like potentially just dropping Fandral on curve next turn, and sometimes having it stick. Like if he just deals with the totem golem here. If he doesn't deal with the totem golem, there's just no way his Fandral ever lives. Right, once something else is yep. developed alongside it. I agree. I agree. I still think you have to play the Fangel. I think it's too passive to, you know, just Raven Idol and Hope, and I think it's too passive to, you know, Hero Power and say go. I guess you could do Power of the match, Wild Yeah, match power. three twos, right. Uh, it doesn't feel good, It doesn't right? feel good. It's all for an extra card off Fandral in a matchup where you probably won't have time to play the extra card. Right. It's so like, like what, what minion, which I guess is the extra thing, so you're going to take a spell anyway, mm -hmm. so, like, the minion is your bonus. Like, yeah. what minion are you just going to snap pick off Fandral and go, yes, like, now now I'm winning this matchup, like, done. I I have no idea against Aggro Shaman, right. really. Like, uh, you know, BGH could be cool. <laughs> sure, <nice. laughs> Yeah, I like it. But, like... Let's uh, do that. Most of the time against Aggro Shaman, you're playing spells super defensively. You're just trying to kill all of their stuff before you die. Yeah. Like, they're so aggressive. You know, it's in the title of the deck, and it just doesn't fit your strategy to really be trying to go for any sort of value plays, especially in the early stages of the game where the game is really all about tempo. Yeah, and this, this Lava Burst, I feel like more and more as I watch Aggro Shamans and, like, play the deck myself, I just see Lava Burst hitting... Violet Teachers, Fandrels, Emperor Thorasans, like, time Gotta after time. Gotta kill those minions. Right. There's just so many must-kill minions in the game are just sat of five health, and it's just like, well, all right. I mean, I guess I'd love to Lava Burst you in the face at some point, but yeah. I guess I have to kill that thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big uh, personal fan of ignoring the Emperor Thorasans. <laughs> I, I, I can't ignore Fandrel, though. Like, that, that card's too nuts. Well, I feel like you can ignore Emperor Thorasans a lot more often than you can ignore Fandrel. Have you ever gone next level and, and ignored, ignored an Aviana? <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> I don't think I've ever ignored an Aviana ever while playing Hearthstone. Okay. I think I've, I've always screenshotted it, then killed it every time. <laughs> Uh, so Raven Idol picks up Claw by the looks of things, which is going to provide him with a pretty decent, you know, quasi board clear this turn. Just isolate the one-one totem with the living roots. And again, this is, you know, a hopeful ploy that maybe we can get Emperor down next turn, and that sticks to the board, and we start getting a, a fight back that way. So this is just survival mode for Naaman right now, but it's all about like trying to find that one platform somewhere in the game where he can start building a counter punch from. Yeah, he's going to be able to build a counter punch with uh, the turn after this. He's going to be able to play Wisps of the Old Gods and then uh, buff them all for plus one, plus one. Right. Get him right outside of Maelstrom Oof. portal range. Well, Unless a spell power yeah. totem is rolled here by Ecop. Exactly. Get, get right outside of Maelstrom portal range three out of four times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were having uh, interesting discussions about probability earlier, so you know that three out of four is roughly 100% guaranteed to work against you. Pretty much, yeah. And we do see it. He's able to pull it off. So the Lightning Bolt's able to cleanly answer this with the 1-1. One, one. And he has the Maelstrom portal for the most likely turn from Naaman next turn. So that that spell power told him roll there could be the deciding factor that allows Ecop to win this game. I mean, he still has 
enough life to play with. Like, it's dwindling, but there's a couple of turns in there where he can still be stable, so... There's a hunter hero power, though. There is a hunter hero <laughs> power, which changes <laughs> that, a lot. That gets like, things real scary. But he does it, you're right, he has the Anixia follow-up, and right, maybe he's right. got enough time to pull off the value that Anixia has, but... Yeah, yeah. Hello, friend! <laughs> Dude, this is a bummer. This card is probably the biggest surprise to me in the oh, entire yeah. set because... I did not think it was going to be good. And right. It, it's nuts. It, it really is. Like, any, like, we can look at that card and say, sure, like, there's going to be situations where, like, Forbidden Ritual happens and you just, like, destroy their dreams, right? But, like, what wasn't apparent to me is how good just, like, Argent Squire, they play a 3-2, you Maelstrom Portal with. Yeah. Like, yeah. That, that's just great. Like, yeah. It's, it's, it's such good. a versatile card. Yeah, it's way better than expected for sure. And even with Zoo kind of like out of the ladder meta right now, we see all of the shamans yep. on ladder running Maelstrom Portal, just attesting to how strong the card is. And, uh, you know, Ecop's going to be able to close it out. And Nixia is a little bit too mm. slow. The Angry Chicken is going to be able to get in there and finish. <laughs> finish that sentence. Is that, is that what you're going for? <laughs> no, you right. just finished. All right, okay. Won the game. There was, there, was there was a slight trailing off towards the end there as if you were searching for a word, so... No? No. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Ecop still, a man with a, a sense of style, putting in the killing blow with the angry chicken. Not not the most spectacular chicken kill I've ever seen in my life, but still, bonus points always yeah. for finishing a game with an angry chicken. For sure. So he's able to counter the Druid now, which is expected with the Aggro Shaman. It's, generally speaking, an Aggro Shaman favored matchup, if ever so slightly. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, you still expect him to be able to pull out that win. Nyman's already done the damage with the Druid now. So now, since Ecop has to stay on Shaman, he can counterpick him with the Zoo Warlock. Right. And we can see just the damage that the Druid was able to do so far. Now, Ecop, if he loses this game, which he's likely to, you know, be behind in this game. We see Nyman also has the tech here with the Crazed Alchemist, mm -hmm. able to take down some totems and whatnot. Um, if he loses this game, he then has to win with Druid up against Zoo. So he has to do what Nyman did to him and be able to high roll and get those innervates and what sure. have you. Right. So th this matchup now, you know, for the longest time people have said, you know, this is a good matchup for Zoo. But Shaman now has those extra tools where, you know, portal, yeah. like, for, like first things first, they've only started playing Lightning Storm pretty recently, mm -hmm. right? So potentially that's still in the deck. Now they have Maelstrom Portal as well. Like, I I'll confess, I haven't played much of the new forms of these decks since Karazhan started coming out. I've been mostly like trying out yeah. the new interesting stuff. So like, sure. how have the interactions between these decks changed based on Maelstrom Portal primarily? Uh, if we look at the like grand scheme of ladder stats, you go to like the Vicious Syndicate sure. data tables and what have you, they'll, they'll put it at Zoo's favored, you know, like 51%. Okay. <laughs> or, you know, like two months ago, it said Shaman was favored 51%. So, you know, it goes back and forth basically month to month, depending on what people are running as tech cards that month, I guess. Mm. But the, the consensus is it's pretty 50-50. It's going to be a really close match. It comes out to whoever gets a better start. Currently, Ecop's got the better start by miles. He's going to be able to go Coin Totem Golem. That's going to overload him for one. He can follow up with Finley. And then he's got the choice of three drops after that. And he's going to be playing two totems in that sequence, potentially, allowing him to play things from below on turn four. So his one through four is mapped out as pretty much the strongest you can possibly do as Shaman. Yeah. And I'm so. honestly, like, not sure what Ecop's considering here. Oh, it's like, Coin Totem Golem Yeah, with, like, 100%. the double three, one, two hand, your curve is Coin Totem Golem one into three oh, every single it's time. It's Coin Totem Golem into Finley, into Tuscar, into Things From Below, done. Yes. Every game. Yes. Ecop, come, please, come on. Play the Totem Golem. Whoa. Oh. whoa, whoa. <laughs> I, I just, I don't, I don't understand. I, I genuinely don't. This is just a 100% totem golem, right? I, I, I'm struggling to even present a merit for playing Finley first. He doesn't have any way to even buff the Finley. Right, which is, you know, the, like what I would go to here is like what his mentality was. It's like, you know, maybe I can abusive this up into a 2 2 or a, you know, a 1 3 or whatever. Like, maybe he's trying to trick Nyman into thinking he has two totem golems. Mmm. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. All right, nailed it down. There we go. We got I, you gotta play the, the tentacles. Yep, yeah, he's yep, got to need yep. to have a target on the board to be able to power overwhelming to try and get something done the following turn. I think Ecop's curve is strong enough. He can justify trading if he feels so, but I personally would punch him in the face. Yeah, I mean... You walk a little bit into, like, power overwhelming abusive if sure. you don't trade. If you right. are trading, your opponent only has one body they can buff. Yep. So that means they can only kill one of your minions, so you're guaranteed to be a minion ahead. So it's, like, a lot safer, but... 
the same time, you know, three damage is a lot. You're an aggro deck, mm -hmm. and a lot of times this matchup can come into a race situation later on. Given he got hand, it's likely that he's going to be able to, you know, go nuts on the board and pull far enough ahead that way, but it, it's still a possibility. I think, like, given the start from Naaman, like, turn one nothing into turn two Forbidden Ritual, there's either a very, very niche world where he's drawn exactly every expensive minion in his deck, or one of those cards is power overwhelming, right? Like, mm -hmm. so... I can understand trying to get some value out of the Totem Golem, just even, even like not considering the full punish of Power Overwhelming plus Abusive, I think you yep. can definitely put your opponent on the Power sure. Overwhelming specifically and just want to pick up that extra 1-1 of value before it dies. Yeah, Ecap able to go Feral Spirits here. He knows there's most likely a Power Overwhelming, so setting up for the things from below. Walks into, you know, one of the 1-1 Imps off of the Imp Gang boss, trading into his things from below. So that's why he doesn't go with Tuscar to try and set that up. He's going to go Ferals and then most likely play out his Totem Golem. Since he was able to find the second Totem Golem, it's a, a really strong card. Able to, you know, make up for the tempo loss of playing Ferals a little bit. Yeah, and this is you know some, something that I think we've we've seen disproportionately little in tournament games. I keep you know trying to make this point. I remember a cast with Nimtra, I was trying to convince him that like Shaman was fine in this matchup. Like maybe it was slightly unfavored, but it can get the job done if it gets like a totem golem early. It can really push through. But the totem golem is nuts. Yeah, right, the totem that's, golem that's is the, that's aim defining. The, the, the number one thing is coin totem golem. Right. That that wins games. Absolutely. When you go coin totem golem as Shaman, your win rate is absolutely nuts. Yeah. Like, people have tracked the win rate on that, and it's good. It's real good. I, I believe you. <laughs> Depending on the meta, it's better or worse, but it's always good. Yeah. No citation needed. I just believe <laughs> Yeah. Oh, my God. Wow. Holy crap. Clear the board. That's all gone. Is the greatest flame He's dead. I have seen in a very long time. Game over. <laughs> yeah. I mean, unless they're... Well, hang on. It, it, this he is could get a, a second pretty... Forbidden Ritual, I guess. Yeah. But even then... Second it, Forbidden Ritual, and then Ecap needs to not top deck Maelstrom. Right, I was going to say, based on the way this game's been developing, even if there was a Forbidden Ritual drawn here, it would be answered immediately <laughs> by a top deck Maelstrom ball. Yeah, and Ecap's next turn is amazing as well. He's going to be able to play, you know, Totem Golem, which is going to reduce his things from below down to three, and, you know... For five mana, he's able to play a ridiculous amount of stats. That's just Yo. eight, nine worth of stats if he wants to. That Mortal Coil is really good, though, for Nyman. It is. Can it's... clean up the 3-1 the if he chooses. Yeah, it looks like the 3 one's the best target. I mean, obviously, like the, the taunts are kind of higher priority by nature of them you know, being taunts as well. Sure. But you can take out the right-hand side 4-1. The, the middle 4-1 okesh. doesn't really take that much power off the board because the 1-2 the would just slide over. So... It's so between the Totem Golem and the, the right hand Feral Spirit, he's choosing to like try and try and get through these taunts because he knows that he needs to at some point, right, to interact with the minions like Flame Tongue Totem. Uh, he does have the Soul Fire in hand to try and get that done as well, but like the, the, the taunts are the things that are like dictating his his combat deployment, I guess, which is like what Zoo is best at, picking attacks and directing them with buffs. So there's taunts in the way, he knows that's just gonna like annoy his long term game plan if he's ever to climb back onto the board. It's going to be a challenge for sure. He's, he's definitely going to need to find Forbidden Ritual and it's going to need to be not answered. Yep. Or Ecop would have to, you know, ignore his minions for some reason. Mm -hmm. But uh, in Ecop's shoes, he should definitely play, you know, as many stats onto the table as he can and trade the minions. I would prefer going the Totem Golem and Things From Below route rather than, you know, the Argent Horse Rider and keeping more of your minions on the field. Just because uh, the minions you're keeping on the field have one health and they die to the... Uh, Forbidden Ritual if they have to trade into the Forbidden Ritual. So I like right. developing minions that don't. You also just open yourself up to get punished by Knife Juggler as well, right? That's yeah. that's one of the other niche ways that, that Zoo can get back onto the board. Is, is it's like Knife Juggler, it's Soulfire if it's in the deck, or things from Peddler, or it's Forbidden Ritual. I think that's basically the, the extensive list of ways they can come back from behind. So I think this play is the more aggressive play, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think it is the absolute best play. I think it's... Uh, it's really hard to tell which is the absolutely winning most play, sure. but um, yeah, it's 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 all right. You, you get also the benefit of the things from below is going to be cheaper in the future. It sets up for the Tuscar with it a little bit, I guess. Mm -hmm. So get, getting extra discounts is also a factor to include there. So Ecap's next turn is going to be even stronger since this turn was a little bit weaker. So you know he's building up the the tension on his even stronger turns with a little bit of risk of you know Forbidden Ritual being kind of awkward on the upcoming turn. Yeah, and Direwolf is just not going to be good enough there. Naaman accepts it. He understands a lost position when he sees one. Still a long way off actual lethal on board, but 
name and understands a, a game that is not being won when he sees one. And now, Ecop is on the hill of uh, a top eight, uh, top eight minimum finish. In fact, yeah. uh, Insomnia True Silver three. Yeah, he's got uh, his shaman remaining, and Naiman only has his shaman, right? So right. the shaman mirror. Ecop has going for him, so that's about 50-50, and then, you know, he has some amount of odds to win the games after that if he loses, yep. so you have to imagine Ecop's in a favored position. Yeah. Yeah. Even just, like, if, you, if you're queuing into two unfavored matchups when you're 2-1 up, you are still in a favored yep. position most of the time, so the the mere fact that one of them isn't a mirror means that it's, it's advantage from the get-go, and then the fact the other one's even slightly favorable means that he is, like, very, very good odds to be victorious in this in this series. Yeah, this is when the pressure can really get to you, though, because you're like, I'm supposed to win. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to win. And then you start, like, getting that stuck in your head, and then you, you, one thing goes wrong, and you start tilting, and... Yeah, it, it can be a little bit tricky to finish. This is where a lot of players oftentimes choke, and you see reverse sweeps happen, so... You know, Ecop's a pretty experienced player. He's been around in the scene for a while. Hopefully, he's able to keep his head about him and, uh, you know, close out this series. So here's my question, Fiber. Okay. In this matchup, in the mirror matchup, are Squires good enough? Like, I know, I know yeah. like... Yeah, Squires are real good. Okay. Squire plus Rockbiter, Squire plus Lightning Bolt kills Totem Golem. Squire plus Flame Tongue Totem kills a bunch of stuff. I would keep both Squires. I, this, this is the question I was going to ask. Like, do you keep both Squires, like, and limit your chances of getting the buff cards? Or do you just keep one and try and maximize the chance to get a buff card to go with it? Ecop seems to favor the, the latter line, but I can definitely understand keeping both of them. Hey, well, best of both worlds, I guess. Yeah, he's not able to pick up the buff cards yet, but, right. you know, I... That is a really tough question, to, if, to keep both or not. But with just, the coin, you can coin them both out, but coining them both out is oftentimes a weak play. Yeah, so. It's just interesting, because, like, one of the things I... Like, it took me a while to, like, really get my head around in the zoom mirror is just, like... Just one drops are not enough. You want to have like yep. the right one drops, right? Yep. So sure. um, it's just a question like, what are the right one drops in the Shaman Mirror? Essentially, is the well, equivalent. I, I prefer uh, Argent Squire to Tunnel Trap. Okay, interesting. Yeah, in in any sort of aggressive mirror where you're fighting for board control, because you know you got that. It requires two hits to be destroyed, which is much more valuable than three health, in my opinion. Maelstrom Paul, the God. Look yeah, at it's, this. it's insane. Look at that. The card ball. is just so good. Yeah, it's nuts. It's absolutely not. It's really good when it gives you a tunnel trog yeah. here too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tunnel trog, mana worm, arcane anomaly, dead uh, Ar injured squire crowded. number three. Yeah, squire. Hilarious. I mean, this is a slightly less uh, powerful maelstrom pull, but it's still probably looking like it'll be effective at some point this game if he just yep. doesn't just go ahead and slam it here. Well, if he slams it here, though, the, the downside is what else is he doing? Right, like rolling exactly. a totem or playing yeah, an Argent Squire? Yeah, yeah. I think you want to use all your mana for tempo. Agreed. The way to do that is Flame Wreath Faceless. Yep. 100% agree with you. There is a 7-7 seven, seven to come back the other way, though. Lava Burst, is it enough to detract you? Nah, no, nah, you play Flame Wreath Faceless. Yep. I believe your opponent has to trade out of the, the respect for Lava Burst. Yeah, I mean, with on their three mana with nothing else on the board, they cannot challenge your 7-7 seven, seven from hand. Yep. You can challenge their 7-7 seven, seven plus the extra minions that you have as well. So, yep. yeah, they are forced to respect the trade here. Yeah, so if Nyman goes face, he's going to get absolutely punished. Yep. He needs to recognize the situation, make the trade with the Flame Reed Faceless, kind of own up to it. Uh... And now we're just back with that same awkward three mana turn we had last turn, right? It was just like, ah, oh, Maelstrom Portal Argent Squire is mediocre. We drew the Flame Juggler, which is still a little bit awkward. Like, it's not too bad. I mean, it, it would have been great if it hit the 2 1, for example, but in, in this situation, you feel like you're just going to get tempoed out. It's, it, it feels like you've. You've passed like half a turn essentially back to your opponent here. Like you haven't already, you haven't even done enough to catch up on board, and they still have their whole turn to develop ahead of you. Yeah, well, lucky for Naiman, Ecop does not have that much to develop. We see him just going with the abusive sergeant here, and he, now he's got to decide how much he wants to play around Maelstrom Portal, if at all. You, you know, Naiman has not been signaling Maelstrom Portal even in the slightest. He's sure. had so many great opportunities to use it. Ecop might not put it in his range of cards that could even be in his hand right now. Yeah, very, very true. We do see he, he's buffing the Argent Squire without the Divine Shield, which signals he's potentially trading it into the 2-3. Mm -hmm. He is going to be playing around Maelstrom Portal there, so... I mean, how much does this matter, though? Because the, the shields just trade the other way anyway, right? And the, the portal comes down, kills all the one health minions regardless. Well, you kill a, a Divine Shield off a of 1-1 one, one this way now. Sure. All right. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so he, he, I guess that's a difference. It, yeah. it could be a difference maker. Right. It's, yeah. uh, these are the little things that matter in 
you know, aggro matchups. Yeah. Also, your spell power totem sticks around. Yeah. If you, you have, if he opts to kill your one one. Right, and I think that might potentially be more relevant than the bubble, especially with like storm in hand and possibly yep. a feral spirits coming down sometime in the near future. We may see Naiman even hold out even longer for value. Uh, it looks like he's rolling it. He's going for the spell power here oh. and then using it. Yeah, I like this because it gives him the the one in four to snipe down the spell power totem as well. I'm sure we'll yeah. see the the bubble traded here into the one one. And oh my god, the tunnel, the trog. tunnel trog! It happens every so often. There's not a lot of one drops. Right. He's going to go for killing the 1-1 one, one over the spell power. And um, is that going to be the storm for Mikab? I think the storm's a little bit premature here. I almost would like to see him just doom him I in the face. In the, in the face? Yeah. Wow. The minions died a storm. That's true. I guess then that is true. That the doom hammer sets up your storm to be able to clear, right? So you right. roll twos and then you punch with doom hammer. Okay. But uh, yeah, storming before the ferals even come down could be premature. You know, it, it depends how risky you want to be, but with the Ecop's life total being at 28, I would have really appreciated Doom Hammering him in the face. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, so so what's the fear at that point? Like, Feral Spirits, I guess, is scary because you'll lose your Spell Power Totems? You, you lose likely. the Spell Power Totem, but you have three minions on your opponent's side with three health. Yeah. So you only need to roll three on one of the three of them with your Storm, and then you can finish off the other two with Doom Hammer. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I buy it. Um, just as, as a follow-up, like, Naaman's list here is kind of like the old-school build, honestly. It's yeah. like the build of, like, when these, when, um, you know, uh, Eternal Sentinel, for example, first came out, when Whispers first dropped, this is the build people were running with the, you know, um, extra overload uh, unlocks with the, the new cards and the Ancestral Knowledge still to draw more cards. Like, why is Naaman appears to be, like, one of the last holdouts to this list as opposed to the 6-0 style list with the things from below and Tuscars, like... What's, been what's having the benefit? Success with it. One of, one of the biggest benefits of it is it's unexpected. Okay. A lot of the players, especially when you, you like, if you don't know Nyman and don't know that he always brings this list or you haven't seen this list before, you're going to automatically assume regular aggro shaman. There's things from below. There's all these biggish things, and they don't deal that much damage out of hand. Their reach is this much. Right. They can't draw extra cards. Sure. And Nyman just suddenly ancestral knowledge is into double lava burst and kills <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, it's just a different angle of approaching the matchup. And instead of using big things, he, he relies more on pure burn damage. And when people don't expect that, he's able to punish them. But uh, I believe believe Ecop expects that, and that might be why he's playing so uh, passively this game, is because he feels like his aggro shaman deck can actually just outvalue Nyman, Nyman's aggro shaman deck. Right. But uh, may not be the case with how the draws are lining up. But yeah, this, this matchup's now reached that point where like there's this awkward stalemate situation where both people are looking at their hands and saying, well, I have a rock buyer, so if I can just buy a couple of turns here, my rock buyer wins the game. But like when there's one in each hand, that doesn't really get either player anywhere. Yeah, he might be just like bolting one of these wolves, rock bitering the other, and yeah. then pushing face. Then, because you don't want to take too much damage in here, in fear that your opponent has a rock biter. They've been having a card sit there for a while. Could be a biter, could be a burst. Mm -hmm. Either way, it's a lot of pain. Yeah, I mean this this bolt happens for sure, but it's and a decision he, he, of like lava burst or easy. Okay, or he's, he's avoiding even taking the two health. Wow. Okay, that is very defensive. Wow. He loses a bit of damage there. But right. That is, um, like, valuing his own life at, like, significantly higher premium than his opponent's life, essentially, is the mm. point there, which is kind of weird when you're just playing an aggro mirror, so... Yeah. Assuming it was... How much extra damage could he have pushed? He could have pushed an extra... Um, two damage, I guess, for the loss of two of his own health? Yes. It's not really... It wouldn't set up anything for him, and it could potentially set I guess, up something Yeah, I guess Nyman. that's a good way to look at it, sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so yeah, Rockbite is just going to come through here from, from Naaman, get through Whoa. that damage before any potential taunts come through, and with Lava an extra 7-7... Seven, seven, taunt Totem? Nope, Taunt Totem doesn't do it. Nope. And that is just going to be game. Naaman is going to square this up, coming back with the, the old school list of, uh, of Agro Shaman coming out victorious in the mirror, which means we're going to go back into the final game, which is right back where, in fact, we started more or less with the, the Druids coming up against a matchup where it's going to need to uh, put itself in an advantageous position. Mm -mm. I think really the story of what happened in this game was basically like Ecop was actually ahead in the beginning. He got off to a, yeah. a better start. Agreed. And I think he he kind of used his resources a little bit too quickly. Mm. I think he could have waited out for a little bit more value on the storm. I think uh, there were some turns where he could have committed to going all face a little bit earlier. Agreed. If he was going to go on that plan. So uh, 
you know, there's a couple things you can look back on there on that game and uh, have to wonder about. Yeah, I think like when you when you brought boiled it down to like the the, the Doomhammer face play, and it's like okay, so like worst case scenario in this world is he feral spirits, and then yeah. in feral spirits, like worst case scenario, you only have to win one roll. Like, well, and he had lava burst and a rock biter already in hand, which is right. 15 damage. Right. His opponent was at 22. You know, you knock him down by four. They're at 18. You're looking for three more to close out the game. That's he. You know, double lightning bolt, rock biter, second burst. Sure. Flame Tongue Totem, I think, because he had minions on the board, right? So, you know, you get down to being a little bit more aggressive. It does, it's really easy when you're ahead, you know, two to one to be like, all right, I just got to play passively and I'll win the game. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. you're getting too comfortable right. and uh, a player like Nyman's not going to not gonna give up any time during the game. So he's not going to let you get away with that. So, But... Uh, you made the point at the start that like the Druids Innervate. were kind of interestingly <laughs> positioned in this series, where they would have to, you know, um, roll high in terms of their opening hands, in terms of it to be able to pick up a win here. We saw Naaman do it exactly. Ecop not quite the same level of uh, explosivity, but Innovate Mirekeeper is definitely not the worst thing in the world. Definitely, even when matched thing. up against the Totem Golem, which seems sure. awful, like it's still fine. It's not the worst. Yeah. Peacock going to consider his options here, but you you just turn this innovate into permanent mana, right? Like it's you just, do. It's just you what do. you do. I think uh, it's a bit too ambitious to go for the two-two. Yeah. You're going to just run out of stuff that you can do with your early mana turns too quickly. Your 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 curve isn't built around not getting mana off this guy. Mm -hmm. Like you have to do it just based on how your deck is designed. Yep, agreed. Naaman with zero respect for the 3-3 three, three jams into the face. He can get punished for it here if uh, Ecop wants to go down this line. And he could He's going to just make the, the... Living Roots and Power of the Wild, right? Yeah, though, exactly. Yeah. Just perfect clear. And the Storm is in hand for Naaman, but it'll be an incredibly early Storm if he feels like he needs to commit it yep. already. And it was an, an early st a Storm this early in the game is so destructive to your tempo that and you can not only that, so far behind. Naiman's developing nothing while storming. Typically, right, exactly. you're like pushing damage while storming. Yeah, yeah. Ecop just has a free oh. turn of full mana to develop an Azur Drake onto the board, completely uncontested. So now he's going to have spell power uncontested against whatever Naiman develops, and he only has two mana to develop instead of four. Right, and they, so he has Wrath to just take out, you know, cycle a card on a small minion or take out a four health minion if it comes down to that, which is unlikely yeah. unless it's second Totem Golem. And if he doesn't have to Wrath, he just now curves straight into Emperor. Yeah, and Naiman's deck isn't running things from below, right? It's running the Ancestral Knowledge Package yep. in, instead, which gives it less recovery mechanisms for this. This is a deck that yeah. definitely relies on getting a really good start early on, and then you can use card draw to draw into burn to finish your opponent. Yeah. Well, burn doesn't finish your opponent when they're at 27. Right. So, exactly. like, normally, it's recovery mechanism when it loses the board. It's just is killing them. kill you. Yeah. Like, <laughs> a, equip a Doomhammer and then keep drawing cards until I find some rock buyers. Exactly. That's generally the plan, but like that does not deal 27 damage. I'm sorry. Like, yeah. Doomhammer's good. It's, it's not that good. It's not going to get you there. Yeah. I mean, two Doomhammers and, you know, eight turns and maybe we can talk. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure, let's do that. That sounds like a plan. Make it happen, Viva. Make it happen. I want to see you play a game of Aggro Shaman where you beat Token Druid with all 16 charges of Doomhammer. I just need... Uh, Bog Creeper Shaman with two Doom Hammers. You know, ah, nice. Yeah, it might work. I uh, changed the build. Coming to a YouTube channel near you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right, so how does Nyman win this game? What is what is the plan? We, he's got a combo in his hand. He's got the, the Flame Tongue Argent Horse Rider. He can't deploy it yet, but that's definitely a cute thing to look out for in the future if you can mm -hmm. hold on to it. He can't really kill this... Emperor Thorsan, which is a bummer. That's going to proc again. Ecop, although, doesn't have too many cards to really abuse it. I, I think you just got a totem here. I don't think you want to play the Flame Tongue totem. I mean, I mean uh, that helps. It's it's not yeah. quite enough to get the job done, but obviously it's a swing in Naaman's favor. He needs a lot more of those over the course of the game sure. now to, to fight back into this, but it's a start at least. But the hits for a while do at least just keep on coming here for Ecop. Like, Ancient of War plus Wrath on the following turn is just another huge issue. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely huge. But yeah, Nyman here going with the Totem, just preserving as many bodies on board so next turn he can get max value out of Flame Tongue. Ugh. 
Ugh, I feel, I feel, I feel a little bit gross by that. It's just like, all right, finally, my hand is out of value. What card shall I draw? Hey, the card that gives me three more cards. And, and they all get an Emperor proc. Yep. I, I like the second Wrath here, and then I, I, I would nourish for cards. Get all of the cards. Uh, I don't like, you, I, you like, I like war first, right? I, well, I like war and clear the board with the Wrath, and then you have your Emperor protected anyway, so like, yeah. how often does this Emperor actually die and stop you discounting the Nourish next? Yeah, time? yeah, I, I, I'm too greedy. I'm too <laughs> greedy. I, I just, I want to see all the cards get discounted. I... It's fine, you'll see it. It'll just happen next turn, all right? Just patience. Good things come to those who wait. <laughs> Good things come. I, uh, Nyman's got a real big puzzle in front of him. I think maybe it's time to just abandon the board and go for the uh, Elemental Destruction if he runs it. Mm. He's already played one Storm. Maybe he runs two? That's true. There's so much There could be like an there. Elemental Destruction plus um, a Lightning Storm, full clear the Giant Druid board sort of thing going on. I appreciate your commitment to the art of casting here, Firebat, that you're <laughs> trying to find worlds where Nyman can still win this I, game. It's possible. It is. It, uh, Depending on if he runs the cards. It's, like, it's not a card you typically see, but I saw Nyman run it at Star Ladder. He, he may still run that card. But yeah, Ecops here just going to continue dominating the board, able to wrath off the Flame Tongue Totem to preserve a lot of health on his minions. And uh, even just develop the one ones out there to just have more bodies to be able to trade with. Discount is a uh, giant. Yeah, why not? There's no real use of it as a source of damage, right? I mean, I guess you could just use it to snipe down a 2-3 a, a directly and, and sure. preserve even more health. But yeah, I mean, 1-1s on the board seems just fine. I'm not sure why he's targeting a 4-3 right now, though. This doesn't seem... Well, if, if he wants to kill a 4... He could kill a 4-3 and then a hero power Living Roots That's the other 4-3. are right, yeah, Preserve yeah. all of the health on all of his minions to try and make sure that they're not walking into any sort of elemental destruction, which I actually like by Ecap. I think that's the one way he can possibly possibly yeah. lose is weird elemental destruction shenanigans. Sure. So it's a good read by him here identifying how do I lose the game? Right. That's the only way. So let's let's play around it. Let's make that not happen. So I, I like the play from Ecop here. He took his time, took the full turn, really analyze everything and make sure he's figuring out the best way to close this game out. Really solid, you know, identification of how to use his time and good management of his resources. And there you go, Fabio. Are you happy now? That's three brand new shiny cards in his hand, discounted by Emperor Thorasan. <laughs> it makes me happy. Okay, good. And, yeah, I mean, no, sorry, Naaman just desperately digging here, needs to find something. It will be a minor miracle needed. It's going to be elemental destruction or bust, more or less. So he's just going to continue to just play for the board where he can and still cycle through his deck. Rockbiter picked up. I mean, this Ooh. exact this is the situation we talked Ooh. about, right? Where like, okay, this is my win condition when I lose when I lose the board, but not only is there still 23 life, there's also just the small matter of a freaking 510 taunt in the way that you need to deal with. Yeah. He's just uh two spell power lightning bolts away. <laughs> Easy. Easy and game. double Lava Burst for the Ancient War. Aside from the small fact that he has given the game up to Ecop, Ecop with the Fist of Jubilation in the air, letting out that scream. Ecop will round out our round of eight as you see the two players embrace there at the end. A lot of respect between the two. You can see how much that means to Ecop, though. We talked a lot about his story at the start and how much it means to him to like still be successful as a competitive player. Yeah, everybody really likes winning and... Uh... Ecop's been on the bad end of, you know, some jokes in the past, and it, it, I'm really glad to see him, you know, having some success. He's been a player that, uh, you know, I, I oftentimes, like, ask people on Battle.net, anyone want to practice, play some practice games? Every single time I've ever asked Ecop if he wanted to practice, right. he's always been like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, he, he's very enthusiastic about the game. He's a good competitor. I'm glad to see him have some success.